Hello and welcome back. Um, it's my distinct pleasure this morning to introduce Innes Meldrum. Innes is the SVP and Chief Commercial Officer of Atsuka Pharmaceuticals USA. Um, Innes leads the commercial success of Atsuka's North American business, which includes neuroscience, uh, nephrology, as well as digital products. Uh, Innes oversees commercial strategy and commercial operations, including market access, training and development, sales and marketing operations, as well as business insights and strategies. So I'm really looking forward to his views on what the future looks like for patients with CNS disorders. Thank you so much for joining us, Innes. Thank you very much, Magdalene, for that warm welcome and welcome everybody to the CNS Leaders Forum. Um, many of us here today have a deep personal connection to mental health. Whether through a loved one, a friend or a colleague, many of us know somebody who's been affected by depression, anxiety disorder, bipolar disorder, schizophrenia or another mental illness. Most of us know also that mental health is one of the most challenging areas to treat and one of the most misunderstood conditions that we face as a society. So I thank you all for coming together for this event from across different com companies and disciplines to discuss ways in which to help solve these challenging issues and improve patient outcomes. Despite the physical distance that separates us today, I am very confident that we are united by collective expertise innovative ideas and an unwavering resolve to see true change in the way mental illness is managed in America. Next slide, please. Because make no mistake, unfortunately, America is in the middle of a mental health crisis. And as a result of the COVID-19 pandemic, it's one that's only going to get worse. As a recently released GAO report demonstrates, the COVID pandemic has exacerbated this crisis that we're facing. The CDC Household Pulse surveys conducted from April 2020 through February this year found that on average 38% of adults reported symptoms of anxiety or depression, which is up over three times from 11% in 2019. So just let that sink in, 38% of the adult population of the US are suffering from symptoms of anxiety or depression. Next slide, please. Over the next couple of days, leaders across the pharmaceutical industry will share their personal experiences and expertise in creating a streamlined, patient-centric approach to tackling CNS disorders. I expect that this important meeting will help set the tone for how we, collectively, can align our business objectives with R&D efforts to help mould the future of CNS therapeutics development and, most importantly, position patients central to our endeavours. There is an opportunity for our industry to step up and build on the positive COVID-19 vaccine momentum and be a positive creative force, one that works collaboratively with other key stakeholders to make a meaningful impact for patients and society. I think as, as a representative of a pharma company, one of the things the pharma industry we need to realize is that we are one of many key stakeholders and we, we cannot be successful alone in helping patients suffering from serious mental illness. Next slide, please. Over the past several years, there's been increased industry focus on the concept of patient centricity. And as we're all painfully aware, the last 18 months of the COVID-19 pandemic have shone a white hot spotlight on the unprecedented challenges we face and the enormity of the healthcare industry's important duty to meet the diverse needs of patients to deliver patient-focused healthcare innovations. Next slide, please. In many industries, we, as an industry, have had to completely rethink long-standing processes and procedures and quickly develop new strategies for managing patients and involving them in the clinical trial process. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later, about why it's so important navigating vastly diminished supply chains for extended periods of time and helping patients adapt from office visits with physicians to telehealth and virtual appointments to maintain connectivity and treatment adherence in these challenging times. Next slide, please. In the US, we've endured a staggering and quite frankly shocking cost with more than half a million lives lost 
and a healthcare system that's buckling in many places under the strain of providing care during this pandemic. Yet the mental health challenges of the pandemic have not only endured, but arguably have, arguably have been exacerbated. Millions of Americans, including many healthcare professionals on the front line of battling this illness, continue to grapple with the mental health challenges arising from this pandemic. In January of this year, the arrival of a new administration brought a renewed optimism and opportunity to focus on access to mental health care. It is encouraging to see some degree of normalcy beginning to return to our lives now that multiple vaccines are available and in circulation. What should not diminish, however, is the commitment and drive towards accelerating a patient-centered approach for the future. Next slide, please. As part of my role at Otsuka, I help to formulate and facilitate programs at every stage in the life cycle, from ensuring the successful introduction of new indications for our products, to preparing the market for new compounds in our mental health pipeline, to finding new opportunities for our legacy products to improve care. I do love my job, but I'm even more passionate about ensuring our commercial activities meet the needs of the people who use our products. At the end of the day, this is why we do what we do. Within that context, you can also say I'm a chief patient officer. And in fact, uh, we think of everybody at Suka who works for at Suka as a chief patient officer. Now, this is quite a profound statement and one that can have a different meaning to each of us. So whether you're a scientist developing a compound, you're working out in the field, calling on healthcare providers, or are part of a home office function, developing strategies and executing plans to best support the patients we serve, at Otsuka, we feel everyone must act as chief patient officers while performing our important daily work. Now, it may be challenging for every person to see themselves through the lens of a chief patient officer. However, we feel that this is critical and this mindset uh, that we need to shift as we focus on the future. And earlier this year, we launched an extensive internal campaign to help employees share what it means to them to be a chief patient officer. And the results were very, uh, very insightful and uplifting. Next slide, please. As part of our move towards a more patient-centric organization, our goal is to create a scalable and more sustainable business. So we've embarked on a massive, innovative customer engagement transformation that will deliver a more integrated and agile customer experience by completely reimagining roles and expanding capabilities all through the lens of patient centricity. And a key aspect of this is, as everybody sees themselves as a chief patient officer, with that common goal, we can all work much more collaboratively and efficiently together. We know that physicians and patients demand a more streamlined, proactive and holistic engagement experiences that emphasizes impact and quality at every touch point they have with our company. Our hopes are that new, this new initiative will deliver the following on the next slide, please. So local empowerment. Much of care now is delivered at the local level and having a national one size fits all, which has been traditional in the pharma industry is no longer working. What this means for our employees is at the local level, they have greater autonomy and flexibility to meet the local needs of their customers and the patients they serve. This also means coordinated cross-functional collaboration for higher quality customer interactions that create much deeper impact ultimately on patients and it also makes it much easier to work with Otsuka as a company. And then finally, increased agility. Our hope is we'll implement more nimble, modernized internal processes that support a customer aligned approach, all with the single focus of improving uh, the service we provide to customers and their patients. Next slide, please. So why is this holistic approach to patient engagement so important? Because in the US, negative stereotypes and discrimination against people living with serious mental illness are everywhere. Unfortunately, at school, in the workplace, and in our healthcare system. When individuals and their families don't feel supported, they don't feel embraced or valued. 
they do not receive the optimal care that can significantly improve their lives or the lives of their loved ones. They also don't seek help or access the services and treatments that could help improve their lives. Engaged patients are informed patients who proactively want to participate in the decision-making process and that the therapeutic alliance is absolutely critical to successful patient care. The pharmaceutical industry, I believe, has the opportunity to build on the momentum we gained during the pandemic to help bridge patients from suffering an unmet need to receiving sorely needed treatments. This increases the potential for mutual accountability and understanding between the patients and physicians, advocacy groups, and ultimately also with pharmaceutical companies. According to the WHO, informed patients are more likely to feel confident to report both positive and negative experiences and have increased concordance with mutually agreed care management plans. This can result in potentially increased adherence and improved outcomes for patients while also reducing adverse events and contributing to a greater body of clinical evidence. Next slide, please. We also know that it makes a world of sense from a business perspective too, as we strive to innovate and bring the next generation of medicines to the people who really need them most. According to a recent study by the Tufts Center for the Study of Drug Development, and published in the Journal of Health Economics, developing a new prescription medicine that gains marketing approval is estimated to cost a staggering $2.6 billion. Additionally, the same study found that while the average time it takes to bring a drug through clinical trials has decreased, the rate of success, unfortunately, has also gone down by almost half to where it is now at just 12%. Another report published by the Economist Intelligence Unit and commissioned by Paracel found that drugs developed during patient, using patient-centric designs were more likely to be launched compared to drugs developed without, with a nearly 20 percentage point difference when compared to the control group. And that difference was 87% versus only 68% in the control group. The analysis also found that patient-centric trials took less time to recruit, making them much more efficient. Drugs developed using innovative methods appear to be favored by payers, incurring up to a 41 percentage point increase in achieving payer formula addition in the US, the EU, and also in Japan. Researchers believe these results are based on the ability of a patient-centric trial to positively engage patients. And then finally, in June last year, the FDA provided the industry with guidance on patient-focused drug development. This stated the need to demonstrate data collection that moves beyond therapeutic effect of the compound to also include the impact on the, of the condition on the patient's functioning and importantly, their quality of life, as well as patient preference for outcomes and experiences with treatments. It's very clear we have a lot to do, um, so let me shift into some specific stats related to mental health, as well as ways in which Otsuka is attempting to impact and improve patient access and success. Next slide, please. So let's discuss some of the key challenges we are facing as an industry that's really holding back and hampering progress. Earlier this year, Rand Healthcare, a, divi a division of the prestigious Rand Corporation, a non-profit, non-partisan research organization published its findings on how to transform the US mental health system report. The research sponsored by Asuka should hopefully galvanize our nation around the need to address the mental health pandemic that has been exacerbated by COVID-19. RAND researchers examined the mental health system broadly, including not only the institution and resources that support the delivery of mental health services, but also the social determinants of health that impact the lives of those in need, including housing, homelessness, incarceration, unemployment, and education. Now, unfortunately, despite an overwhelming need for services and sustained efforts by the policy community to direct attention to the need, the report found that just 45% of people in the US 
with a mental illness received any any mental health treatment which is which is uh, both sad and shocking the story is even more disturbing for for members of racial and ethnic minority groups who are about half as likely to use mental health care as non-Hispanic whites. So if, if just to put that into context, 45% on average and for racial and ethnic minority groups, less than 25% seek care. Also, unfortunately, prisons and jails are now recognized as the largest institutional providers of housing for people with serious mental illness. In addition, there are striking geographic variations in the availability of mental health specialty care with rural areas being particularly underserved. Next slide, please. Based on their insights, Rand articulated three specific recommendations aimed at improving the US healthcare system in three key areas. The first area, promote pathways to care. So this includes promoting comp comprehensive mental health education from kindergarten through grade 12 settings, integrating behavioral health expertise into general healthcare settings, linking homeless individuals with mental illness to supporting supportive housing and developing a mental health diversion strategy centered on community behavioral health which can then help to prevent our jails and prisons being the primary player or place of care for so many living with mental illness. The second area they highlighted was to improve access to care. Recommendations here include strengthening mental health parity regulation and enforcement, reimbursing evidence-based behavioral health treatments at their true cost, establishing an evidence-based mental health crisis response system and expanding access to digital and telehealth services for mental health. The psychiatry community has actually adopted telehealth at a much greater rate than any other uh, area of uh, specialty care and it's something that could be further leveraged as well. The final area is to establish an evidence-based continuum of care and the, within this, to enhance quality of care within the system, Rand recommended that decision makers consider defining and institutionalizing a continuum of care in states and communities, launching a national care coordination initiative, and forming a learning collaborative for Medicaid behavioral health financing. A coalition of people is required to discuss the pressing issues that impact outcomes for patients living with serious mental illness and advance the actions needed to transform our healthcare system. So we're optimistic that there is a willingness to implement the changes that will transform the system into a much more patient-centric one that respects the value of every single mind. I believe it's time for us in the pharmaceutical industry to take stock of the current efforts to develop treatments for CNS disorders. And then the very next question we should be asking is how do we find ways to work together within the neuroscience industry to advance patient treatment on the front line? Next slide, please. No one deserves to be marginalized by mental illness or society's beliefs and attitudes. We must respect the value of every mind whether it's a grand idea that changes the world, a simple human connection that changes someone's life or something in between. The need for innovative approaches to treating mental illness has never been greater. Considering the shortage of mental health professionals, the barriers to care faced by millions and the suboptimal responses to treatments experienced by patients, it is critical now to explore new and novel approaches to treating mental illness. Next slide, please. The need for innovative beyond the pill approaches to treating mental illness has never been greater. Considering the shortage of healthcare professionals, it's critical that we look into this now. The WHO estimates that 50% of people with chronic diseases in developed countries do not take medicines as prescribed, possibly, I would probably say definitely, limiting the effectiveness of these medicines. In the US, this may result in an estimated 100 to 300 billion in unavoidable healthcare costs from chronic conditions due to direct costs 
such as unnecessary healthcare utilisation, as well as other indirect costs. As a result, I believe it is necessary for us as leaders of the pharmaceutical industry to look beyond our, beyond our own company's current clinical pipelines to seek out opportunities to collaborate with key stakeholders across the spectrum who may bring entirely new expertise and mindsets to the table. Next slide, please. Specifically, regarding mental health, it is critical that we expand our research to identify innovative therapeutic categories. In 2019, Otsuka created the McQuaid Centre for Strategic Research and Development, which is dedicated to identifying and funding innovative early stage research and development programmes that have the potential to bring new and innovative treatment modalities to patients. New products are desperately needed for people dealing with mental health conditions, and we are interested in seeing where this research goes. A great example of this is psilocybin therapy. This is a new approach that is currently being investigated for the treatment of mental health challenges. It combines the pharmacological effects of psilocybin, a psychoactive substance, with social psychological support. To investigate the effects of psilocybin as a potential treatment for depression and other illnesses, researchers at COMPASS synthesized the compound to the highest regulatory standards in its psilocybin product. And through their work, I'm very hopeful that psychedelics will be approved in the near future. And that's exciting because this therapy provides a completely new delivery mechanism and has the potential to transform how we approach and treat serious mental illness. Now, that being said, in mental health, we understand there are very few silver bullets that will be available anytime soon. Rather, much like in oncology, modest incremental advances will also be required that will build on top of one another to deliver improved outcomes, hopefully to larger and larger populations. Next slide, please. If we are going to make the impact that we desire, we have to reinforce our industry's commitment to innovating in mental health and to stem the large exodus of companies from this area that unfortunately has been happening for a number of years now. Otsuka is one of the few pharma companies that continues to invest in developing pharmaceuticals pills and long-acting injectables. Also, we are heavily invested in digital medicine and digital therapeutics, which we see as, as great opportunity for a new frontier for the treatment of mental illnesses. However, we also recognize we won't be able to do it alone and patients need and deserve innovation so that they can fully realize their own potential. There is a substantial opportunity to improve care by strengthening the therapeutic alliance between patients and physicians and closing the information and insights gap that has persisted in the conventional relationship between the two. The impact of the coronavirus pandemic has only reinforced the need for and the benefit of integrating digital tools into behavioral healthcare. And personally, I'm very encouraged by the future opportunities for digital innovation to make a significant impact in this space. Advanced digital solutions can make technology much more accessible to patients, generate better evidence to inform treatment plans, ensure patient safety and data integrity, as well as optimizing trials to meet the needs of patients wherever they may be in their own wellness journey. Next slide, please. Even better, research is telling us that more people are interested in virtual care than ever before. A recent study by Accenture reported that 46% of patients would choose to receive mental health appointments virtually. Those born in Gen Z, and I had to look this up because I confess I'm a bit older, um, those born in 1997 or later qualify as Gen Z, were more than four times more likely than baby boomers to prefer virtual care to in-person care. And then additionally, some communities which have historically faced stigma and discrimination may prefer to receive virtual or digital care. Next slide, please. So over the past five years at Otsuka, we've leveraged tools such as e-consent, e-source, e-scanning clinical supplies that provide real-time insight to clinical trial activities. Otsuka has been collaborating with companies such as Verily and also Click Therapeutics to virtualize clinical trials, drive greater patient centricity, as well as greater diversity and inclusion of trial particip participants to ensure that 
those participating in our studies are reflective of the patient population. Earlier this year, we launched the world's first fully remote clinical trial using digital therapeutics and as, a, as an adjuvant therapy in adults with major depressive disorder. Now, more than ever, there is a need for a scalable digital solution that can dramatically expand access to mental health treatment without sacrificing the rigors of clinical validation or a patient-centered focus on engagement and user experience. Digital therapeutics allow physicians to treat people functionally, not virtually, especially segments of the population that are traditionally underserved and have less resources, which in itself is a form of systemic discrimination. Digital therapeutics can level the playing field and democratize treatment because patients can get help where they are when they need it. The other benefit is that digital technology generates big data over time and larger, more complex data sets that over time will generate additional insights that then can be leveraged to improve at population level the, the treatment of serious mental illness. Next slide, please. By challenging health technology with patient centricity at every turn, we can stay on course to deliver a valuable and impactful solution that fundamentally shifts how we view and treat serious mental illness. Some examples, clinician-based virtual care can augment traditional in-person visits with synchronous multimedia appointments. Asynchronous needs can be met through text messaging or strategically developed software applications. Data gathered in real time can identify key characteristics and behaviors that can be used to modify treatment to enhance chances for positive outcomes. The addition of digital treatment provides the mental health system with an unprecedented level of informative data on how patients are responding to their treatment. And this can increase flexibility in providing care while also improving access and convenience for patients, making it much more likely they'll stay adhering to their treatment. Next slide, please. Events over the past year make it imperative to place a spotlight on the issues of diversity, equity, and inclusion in treating mental health in America. We need to urgently establish partnerships to include underserved patient populations in the clinical development process. We must also ensure that these communities have access to these drugs and devices when they are brought to the market. As we know, this is a particular issue in the treatment of mental illness. Lack of access will only further drive healthcare disparities. As researchers and developers of these therapies, we must address the systemic inequities within our healthcare system that limit access after product commercialization. We must simplify the journey for both patients and providers, leveraging patient support services, making it easier for them to learn about our products and services and feel more comfortable enrolling in trials as needed. Digital innovation will in time be a key factor for this. I firmly believe this. While still incorporating the human touch throughout the journey to provide personalized support where and when it's needed. But we also recognize that there are wide disparities in the access to technologies, fundamentals, broadband, smartphones, etc. And I believe that collectively we must advocate for solving this. Within the broader healthcare system, there is an underrepresentation of culture, gender, and ethnic diversity during training and in leadership. To serve the needs of a diverse population, it is imperative that the healthcare system take measures to improve cultural competence as well as racial and ethnic diversity. Next slide, please. Osuka is a corporate sponsor of the Journey to Better Health Consortium led by the Center for Information and Study on Clinical Research Participation. This consortium drives several awareness campaigns annually called Aware for All. The goal is to promote clinical trial participation and research advocating for diversity and inclusion in clinical trials. In addition to the Aware campaign, we've also joined a cross-sponsor collaborative focus on diversity, diversity and inclusion in clinical trials that CISCRP leads. The group is comprised of other pharmaceutical companies and CROs to share best practices, identify barriers in clinical trials, 
and co-create actionable solutions. Next slide, please. So as a nation, we must not rest until every single person in the US is treated with the same level of dignity, respect, and basic human rights. And the full measure of each mind is realized through products, programs, policies, and advocacy. Otsuka's purpose statement is to defy limitation so that others can too. This continues to be our North Star and it permeates every single aspect of our commitment to the patients we serve. I'll conclude today's session by stating that we're only at the very beginning of this journey. Next slide, please. America's growing mental health crisis has accelerated the need for us to explore collaborative efforts on a much greater scale than we've ever done before to develop innovative treatments that will make a meaningful impact for patients and for society. So let's step up together to deliver a more streamlined, proactive and holistic engagement experiences that emphasizes impact and quality at every single touch point. Let's solve these problems working together. Leverage resources such as the RAND report that provide us with a framework for improving the state of mental health care in the United States. Let's explore together. Let's use opportunities such as the one CNS provides to seek out opportunities to collaborate across the stakeholder spectrum with, to improve patient care. Let's leverage digital therapeutics, which can level the playing field and democratize treatment. And let's be inclusive together. As researchers and developers of new therapies, we must address the systemic inequities within our healthcare system that limit access after product commercialization. It's only by adopting a holistic patient-centric approach, the healthcare industry will truly be able to meet customers where they are through their preferred medium to deliver resources and messaging that are personalized to their needs. So with that, I thank you very much for your time and attention, and I look forward to the collaboration that is going to be necessary to take uh, the treatment of serious mental illness forward in the US. So thank you very much, everybody, and I hope you enjoy the rest of the presentations. Great. Thank you so much, Innes, for spotlighting the severity of the mental health crisis in the US um, and setting the stage for the discussions over the next day and a half that will aim to accelerate and improve patient outcomes here and across CNS. At this point, I'll ask the conference participants to uh, leave this area and go over to the sessions tab to join us for the first panel discussion uh, to get us on our way. Thank you again, Innes. Thank you.